Welcome to Scam Baiting Emails. This encounter with an advanced fee scammer includes a tragic death, the love that dare not speak its name, cousins with shady connections, a neighbor who sells burner phones, practicing law in whole England, hurting the scammer's feelings, and I swear I didn't mean to, and why you always should insist on talking to the manager. It begins with this typical teaser email from Ms. Lucia Jacobs. Please confirm if you got my previous email as soon as possible. By the way, I looked it up and that is how you pronounce her name. It's not Lucia. Naturally, I reply, I don't recall receive a previous email from you. Now, I'll interrupt myself for a moment to tell you that when I am responding to a scammer in an email, usually if I make a typo in my own email, I just leave it there. I figure probably it only helps enhance my image of someone who might not be paying as much attention to details as he should. So, I don't recall receive a previous email from you. When did you send it? Sincerely, Rob or as my friend called me, Rob McLenn. It turns out that Lucia Jacobs is a representative of ExxonMobil in London, which in this correspondence she sometimes refers to as ExxonMobil. It turns out they need to reprofile funds amounting to US dollars 11.9 million, and I'll get to keep 30% of it. But she must have confused me with someone else, so I reply, hello Lucia. I wish I qualified for this job, but I don't know anything about the oil business. Perhaps your email was meant for someone whose name is similar to mine, but who is an oil business veteran? I'm not aware of any relatives who ever worked in the oil business, but when you come from a big family like mine, I guess it's not surprising to have at least one relative you don't know. I could email some of my cousins to see if one of them knows who the person in our family is who is a professional oil businessman or woman. Would you like me to email some of my cousins and see if they know which family member has oil business experience? In sincerity, Rob, Rob, McLenn. It turns out it's all quite simple. The money was generated from several already paid contracts, causing a difference in their accounts, and as a contractor to the company, the fund will be reprofiled in my name. Various heads of the department got together and selected me due to the general practice in the corporate world that the interest of an agent employee should not conflict with that of the principal employer. Now, I asked around, and that is the general practice in the corporate world. Lucia just wants to confirm my trust and dedication to this business and appeal to my conscience so that we shall all be happy individuals in the end. This arrangement will require trust and mutual understanding, but as it turns out, I will not be required to email some of my cousins. Wanting to be easy to work with, I tell Lucia, if you don't want me to, I won't email some of my cousins, but I don't know how else to efficiently find out which one of my relatives has oil business experience. You mentioned the importance of confidentiality. Is that why I shouldn't email them? To avoid the risk of hackers seeing the contents and somehow sabotaging ExxonMobil's operation? If that's the concern, I could just call a few of them instead of emailing. One of my neighbors, just two houses away from me, uses special phones for his business that he calls burner phones. He works for a top secret government agency that is so secret he can't tell people exactly what agency it is or what his job is. Whenever he needs one of his co-workers to come over to his house, he calls them on one of the special phones and then he actually throws away the entire phone. I don't know why they're called burner phones. He never burns them, just throws them in the garbage. He owes me a favor from the time some of his cousins, now these are different people from my cousins, stayed at his house for a few days, and it was so crowded there that he asked me to store their suitcases in my garage just for a few days until they left. I'm sure he'd give me a very, very good price if I wanted to buy a few of those burner phones. He might even say something like, I won't accept any payment from you because in the past you've done me great favors, and I'm happy to return your generosity by just giving you this phones. If I can get him to give me six phones, I could call six of my cousins, who I think are most likely to know which family member worked or works in the oil business, and hackers couldn't listen in because they wouldn't even know I've got a telephone that I throw away after using it just once. Do you happen to know what branch of ExxonMobil the person you're looking for worked for? Did he work in London, like you? Or do you know what his job title was? Or even whether he worked in one of your offices or instead on one of your oil rigs, even if you don't know his job title? I promise to keep everything confidential, and I will require my cousins to keep it confidential too. As you say, this transaction must be built on trust and mutual understanding on both sides. I promise to honor the trust you have put into me." Lucia responds with a huge paragraph that doesn't really say anything, and then adds, furthermore, 
McLen Home Values LLC shall be immediately registered as a contractor with ExxonMobil. Thus, your earnest participation in this business is crucial to its successful end. Secondly, we shall need the services of a recognized legal practitioner to undertake the documentation and legalization process, unless you are willing to come over in person. I hope to hear from you again on this pressing issue so that the desired progress can be made, after which the fund will be transferred to you without delay. For your information and record purposes, I'm married to my dear wife, Rita, and I have three children, two boys, Joshua and John, and one girl, Esther. I'm a devoted Christian, and I strongly believe that we must succeed in this transaction and will definitely come together as one big and happy family and best of friends in your country. Thank you very much once again, and God bless you for your understanding and cooperation as I wait to hear from you for further advice. Note, please confirm your address and telephone numbers. Eleven hours later, Lucia adds a surprising biographical detail. Lest I forgot, I lost my husband Andrew last two years, and I wish to keep you informed for your own perusal. Hello, Lucia. Thank you for your emails from June 21 and June 22. I don't remember if I told you I was going to be in the hospital, but this week I was in the hospital and only got back home last night. They had to do a bunch of tests on me, and it involved surgery and knocking me out with gas, and I even had to wear one of those hospital gowns they use on TV shows. I have been kind of groggy all day and holding ice, sometimes frozen peas, which I know sounds silly, but the hospital doctors actually recommend it up to my face a lot. I also have been taking a lot of pain-killing medicine to help kill the pain, although it doesn't work as much as I wish it would. I am so glad to hear that England finally has become more modern and accepting when it comes to LBGBT issues. Did you always secretly have lesbian feelings, or did they develop only after your husband Andrew died two years ago? I am so happy you have found happiness again with your dear wife, Rita. It's like a wonderful ending of a romantic movie. Are all three of your children from your marriage to Andrew, or have you and Rita adopted one or two or all three of them? Experiencing the heartbreak of losing a husband only to find happiness again two years later, of course, grief takes time, by finding a dear wife, it almost makes me think maybe there is a God after all. Now, I threw that in because she says she's a devoted Christian, but it doesn't seem to bother her. I'm very much looking forward to seeing you, Rita, Joshua, John, and Esther when you come to the United States. I'm afraid my house isn't big enough to have you all stay here as my guests, but there's a comfort inn not far from here where you can stay. And of course, I'll be delighted to show all of you the many sights around here. We've been talking so much about all these personal things that I almost forgot we should discuss business too. Per your instructions, I will have a lawyer friend register McLen Home Values LLC as soon as possible. Not this week, because I'm still recovering from surgery, but I should be able to get it done before the end of next week. I will keep you updated on our progress. In sincerity, Rob, Rob, McLen. P.S. Thank you for the invitation to come to London in person. That is very tempting, and I probably would be calling British Airways to make a reservation right away if it weren't for my recovering from hospital surgery. But again, thank you so much for the invitation. Lucia is happy to hear I'm back from the hospital and writes to intimate me that they have started the process of registering McLen Home Values LLC on my behalf and a such. I don't need to register it again, however. She advised me to send my address, telephone number, so as to enable them finalize with all arrangement. I hope to hear from you soon. Please send me your address and telephone number. Hello, Lucia. Yes, it is a relief to be home from the hospital, although I have bandages on my face that make me look scary, at least to the children who live on my block. Please don't go to the trouble of registering McLen Home Values LLC, because my attorney already is working on that. He's going to charge me his regular very high rate for drawing up the papers and filing them with the state or wherever, and he doesn't give refunds, so we might as well get our money's worth. Please, I don't want ExxonMobil to waste its money paying attorneys, which I think you call barristers, to do unnecessary work that already is being done here. Should I fax you the registration documents when they are done? If so, please elucide me about the exact fax number to send them to. And please say hello to Rita for me. Once again, Lucia reminds me, I need you to confirm your address and telephone numbers as it will be in filling application with ExxonMobil. In my reply, I point out, so far I haven't received information for me to confirm. Please send me the information so I can examine and confirm ASAP. 
As I mentioned earlier, you don't have to go to the bother or expense of filing for our LLC. My attorney, or barrister, already is working on that and actually is almost done, except for a few details he asked me to get from you, namely ExxonMobil's complete mailing address, including postal code, which around here we call a zip code, but it's the same thing. Don't worry about that. I'm attaching to the email a picture of the almost completed LLC form. Because I don't know ExxonMobil's mailing address, including postal code, I asked my attorney to fill in those spaces just temporarily with question marks and Florida for the city. He said if he puts in London, the form will want to know the country. That's why temporarily it says Florida. For country, do you say England or Great Britain or the British Empire or Britain or UK or United Kingdom? Once we have that, plus the rest of ExxonMobil's mailing address, he'll be able to formally finish the LLC creation paperwork, and then we can do whatever steps are left to finish reprofiling the funds. So if he would be gentle enough to provide the address information he needs, from here it will be like skipping stones, as they say. Finally, but not last, please give my best regards to Rita. She sounds like a really special person. Yeah, I spelled it with two N's. It's a typo. I already told you I usually leave in the typos. P.S. Please don't forget to send me the information you want me to examine and confirm. Lucia lets me know the United Kingdom should be referred to as the United Kingdom. Pleads with me to keep this confidential and once again requests my address and telephone numbers. Clearly, she doesn't quite understand what is required to confirm such information. Hello, Lucia. Two quick things. One, I think maybe an email got lost somewhere. Please forgive my mansplaining. Do they use that term in the United Kingdom to you? For me to confirm my address and telephone numbers, first I need to know what your records show for that information. Then I can confirm the information you have, or I can correct any errors in that information. For example, maybe I have moved since the address you show for me in your files. Make sense? And two, why do we need to treat this transaction with utmost confidentiality? Certainly we aren't doing anything illegal, are we? I am very law-abiding, as many of my friends can tell you. If I have misunderstood, and in fact there is something illegal about this transaction, regretfully I will need to withdraw from what we are doing. If there is any element of illegality to our transaction, I cannot do it. I could recommend a couple of my cousins, if you want. I am not close with them at all because of their illegal natures. Well, please don't get the wrong idea. The cousins I'm thinking of are nice guys, aside from the illegal things they do. Having said all that, I will be very, very surprised if you tell me that indeed this transaction is illegal. I do not think a devoted Christian woman with three children and a dear wife would act that way. But in the past, some friends have accused me of seeing only the good in people and being blind to the not good in those same people. So it seems only prudent for me to double check with you to make sure everything we are doing is 100% legal. Three, I just thought of another quick thing, so that makes three. I have not told my attorney why I wanted him to organize the LLC for me. And if he asks why, then I'll just tell him it's not really his business to ask such a question. He did send me an email this morning asking when I will be giving him the mailing address of ExxonMobil so he can put it inside the LLC document that gets filed with City Hall. Before you forget, please reply with the mailing address of ExxonMobil. The emails he writes are all stuffy and I don't want to receive more from him than is absolutely necessary. And going back to number one at the beginning of this email, please do send me a copy of the information you have about me so I can confirm or correct it as necessary. To my surprise, Lucia elucided me that all that was submitted was your name, and I am expected to add your address before submitting the application to the ExxonMobil to reprofile the said fund. I express my aforementioned surprise. Oh, they provided you only with my name, but no other information? I never would have guessed that. I am happy to provide the information you need without hesitation. The only problem is I can't just put the information you need into a regular email such as this one. Please do not worry. This is a problem we can easily overcome. It doesn't need to be any kind of obstacle to our mutual goals. You see, when you send a regular email, such as this one, cyber criminals in the dark web can see every word you write. They can even see these words I am writing to you right now, which is why I'm being careful not to say anything confidential. The number one thing that police and experts warn us against is sending personal information in an unprotected email. They all say the same thing. Put your personal information, address, phone number, etc. only in a password-protected secure PDF file. That way, the only people who can see that information are the people who have the password. How do you get the password? It's really easy. 
put all of the information you need answered into a PDF, give it a password, and send it to the other person. Let that other person know what the password is, and then they can open the PDF, provide all the necessary information that you need, close up the PDF using the same password, and then email it back to you. Even if a criminal stole your entire email, they wouldn't be able to see what's in the PDF because they won't know the password. That's the secret. Probably you already know all of this and know how to send me a PDF listing the information you need from me protected by a password. Once again, you must think I am mansplaining something that is as simple to you as a bird on the water, as the saying goes. Please forgive me if you already know about the password-protected PDF, as I'm sure you do. If you could send me those questions in a secure PDF file, I will give the full information and return to you soonest. Regarding if the company has been registered, which was one of the things you asked, I don't think so. Unless I am misremembering, my attorney, or barrister, is still waiting for the United Kingdom mailing address of ExxonMobil. You didn't already send that to me, did you? Ever since my visit to the hospital last week, it seems as though my memory is intermittently faulty. Did you already send it to me and I forgot? By the way, I hope it doesn't offend you that I'm bringing up the following final matter, which was made public today. I'm referring, of course, to the frankly shocking scandal featuring ExxonMobil. I think the scandal is only about ExxonMobil in the USA. Is everyone in your office talking about it? Has it caused any problems for you and your United Kingdom colleagues? Just in case you're not familiar with what I'm talking about, here is a link to a typical news story that appeared today. I think probably it is only the USA branch of ExxonMobil that told all those lies to the public Americans. In the United Kingdom, there is such a thing as dignity and honor, which is something we could use more of here. Please forgive me if that is a sore spot subject for you. I certainly do not want to be rude or impolite to you ever, but I thought I should ask. Is there anything about the ExxonMobil USA scandal that is likely to slow down our progress with our project? In sincerity, Rob, Rob, McClinn. P.S. How old are your three children? Do they all play happily with each other? I grew up only with six sisters. I wish I had a brother like Joshua and John both do. Dearest Rob, I write to confirm the receipt of your email and the contents were fully understood. Here is the address as requested. However, since you are not comfortable with sending me your information through regular email, I will advise you to send me your mailing address and telephone number in a password-protected secure PDF file as suggested and send me the password. I hope to hear from you soon with your address and telephone numbers. Hello, Lucia. Thank you for providing the address of ExxonMobil, United Kingdom, which I have forwarded to my attorney or barrister. Moments after I sent him the address, I received an automatic reply saying that he won't be in his office until Tuesday. That's because Monday is a big holiday here, Independence Day, so he is giving himself Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday off. I don't know why his clients have to suffer in waiting just because he feels lazy. That just seems to be the way attorneys are, at least in the U.S. Are barristers pretty much the same way in the United Kingdom? Do they give themselves long holidays when it's British Independence Day? Again, thank you for sending me the helpful information. Also, if you have time, I really would like to hear more about your three children, and especially about Joshua and John. I hope you have sat them down and told them how lucky they are to have a brother who will be their brother for life. I never had that. P.S. I hope it wasn't impolite of me to ask if the ExxonMobil USA scandal will have any effect on our project. I know the London, England office wasn't involved, of course, but because of the international nature of our project, I thought maybe somehow the entire sordid story might slow things down. After not receiving a response from Lucia for a day and a half, I'm worried that I might have offended her. Hello, Lucia. What do we do next? I hope I didn't offend you by asking if ExxonMobil United Kingdom is suffering any unintended effects of the ExxonMobil USA scandal. I certainly did not mean to imply that I thought you or your office were involved in any way. If that is what it sounded like I was saying, I deeply apologize for that miscommunication. Exactly one hour later, Lucia assures me that I do not feel offended with your question, however. I and my office are not involved in the scandal as recorded in your email. I am still expecting you to confirm your physical address and telephone number. Hmm. There seems to be some confusion here. Hello, Lucia. Regarding my physical address and telephone number, you might recall I had requested for security reasons that you forward to me a password-protected PDF to contain that information. Have you sent that to me yet and I overlooked it? A couple of hours later, Lucia replies, I have no idea how to get the protected PDF as requested. Therefore, I will advise you to get one and send your information then furnish me with a password. I don't know if you've noticed, 
but her command of English is far greater than that of her typical fellow scammers. Sometimes her wording is a bit awkward or unnatural, but if English actually is her second language, then I'm impressed. I have no idea how to get is evidence of a proficiency in English that, well, it's impressive. I mean, for a scammer who's trying to get her hands on my money. Hello, Lucia. I have attached the password-protected PDF with the information you requested. I will send you the required password in three separate emails. Just put them all together as one single long password and everything will work fine. The first third of the secret password. The second third of the secret password. I deliberately do not send the final third so that Lucia will be forced to immediately request it, at which point she will find it difficult to use the password because I will neglect to tell her what sequence each row of digits should follow. But apparently... I didn't do a very good job of protecting that PDF because she's able to open it with what I sent her. Dearest Rob, the telephone number stated in the attached protected PDF is not correct, as it was nine digits instead of ten digits. Therefore, I advise you to cross-check the number and send back to me. I need an update as regards to the company registration as promised, as time is of great essence in this regards. I respond candidly. That is pure sloppiness on my part. It would appear that I haven't yet mastered the art of copying and pasting. The last digit of the phone number is 2. I apologize for inconveniencing you. What is our next step? Dear Rob, I am still waiting for the registration of McLen Home Values LLC as assured, and she hopes to hear from me soon. I explain that the registration of McLen Home Values LLC has been filed with the state of Florida, Polk County. I don't have anything to send you. All of the filing and paperwork are being handled by my attorney's office. Originally, I assumed either his office could provide me with a copy that I could fax to you, or maybe they could fax it to you directly. I was kind of embarrassed when the secretary there laughed at my request. Apparently, these days, such things are filed only electronically, directly to the Florida government. I tried to point out that actually a fax is electronic, but she just laughed even more and seemed to think I was foolish for even mentioning it. Because I have honored your request that I always treat our transaction with utmost confidentiality and not disclose it to my attorney, his office has filed the paperwork, but he does not know any of the details of why I asked him to form an LLC. That covers the entire state of Florida. If you also need an LLC that is legally recognized in the United Kingdom, that is something I am not able to do here. That would have to be done in the United Kingdom. Now that you have safely received my physical address and private phone number, my understanding is that now that you have the information, you can submit the application to ExxonMobil to complete our transaction. When do you expect the application to be submitted so that the funds can be transferred? I'm hoping the remainder of this process can be expedited so that the transfer is completed by the end of this week or Monday at the latest. I have had some unexpected expenses recently, including the medical issue I may or may not have mentioned to you previously. Between that and what I owe my attorney, or barrister, it would really be appreciated if the transfer of funds can be done without further delay. Lucia, again, expresses her happiness in our partnership and also wants me to contact the attorney for the required legal assistance and successful claim of the fund. All I have to do is write a simple letter of application to claim the U.S. dollars $11.9 million. And always remember that nobody should know of her involvement in this transaction. That doesn't sound at all suspicious. Hello, Lucia. It is hard to believe we have been communicating back and forth like this for a full month, but I think that is how long it has been. It certainly is a relief to have completed all of the small yet important details that collectively combine to allow us to move forward with your bold and admirable plan. I shall write the simple letter to the attorney, barrister, following your instructions without deviation. I must admit it is with a certain degree of pleasing excitement that I contemplate all of the good things I will be able to do with my 30% of the total of the funds. There are so many people who need help, especially these days, what with the way things seem to be and might continue as such. Where I live, although most people would consider it a paradise, thanks to the fine weather and the plentiful citrus, I constantly worry about the welfare of the many homeless people I see on the streets and the pangs of hunger that so mercilessly ache in the stomachs of little children who never have known the simple joy of eating so much food at dinner that afterward, when they're running around, they sometimes might even regurgitate the food they ate because they ate so much of it. Once the funds have been transferred, my first priority will be to feed the hungry children who feel so much hunger, closely followed by doing something to help the homeless people in my neighborhood. I've also decided to use a tiny fraction of the funds to build a full-size tennis court in my backyard, complete with lights so I can play at night. I can imagine what you are thinking right now. Playing tennis at night with lights in Florida, the mosquitoes will eat you up. 
But these days, they make sprays and lotions that repel mosquitoes and send them away from you. So I'll get a full supply for me and any of my guests who come to play tennis. Speaking of that topic, do Joshua and John play tennis? I hope so, for I would be thrilled for them to play as guests of honor at our first tournament. Also, Esther could play too if she wants. Do you play tennis? Or perhaps you know it by its old English name, Rounders. If you don't, I would be glad to teach you when you come to my country. And please don't worry about the mosquitoes, because I can keep them away from you. Now I am embarrassed at how much I have rumbled on and on. Please excuse my enthusiasm, which I know at times can be too enthusiastic for some people. I am just so happy that we finally got all of that paperwork and red tape behind us. When will you be coming here? I hope you can come as early as August, next month, when Florida has no humidity and is so comfortable outside you wouldn't even believe it. Finally, I have all of the information you sent me about Barrister Pete Brown, and I will write to him immediately according to your precise instructions. Thank you, Lucia, for putting your faith in me for such an important project. My heart warms at the thought of all the good we will be able to do for so many people. Lucia can't wait to join me in Florida, even though her kids don't play tennis, so as instructed, I write to Barrister Pete Brown. I have been instructed to contact you for required legal assistance necessary to successfully claim U.S. dollars 11.9 million, 11 million 900 thousand United States dollars that is due me as an official contractor for ExxonMobil United Kingdom. I would especially like to specify that I need your assistance to claim contractual funds with the ExxonMobil. I have been assured that this is very easy and that I can handle it, so you should have no worries there. Any and all necessary paperwork already has been filed, establishing me as a trusted contractor, so if you would kindly rubber stamp the successful application, our work will be concluded. Thank you most kindly in advance for your learned assistance, and I hope your favorite football team is doing well this year. Almost all of my British fans, I meant to say friends, it's a typo, almost all of my British fans are football crazy, as they say, and yeah, I had meant to say British friends. And I so advise Lucia. Per your instructions, I have written to Barrister Peter Brown per your instructions. At first, I was going to CC, copy, copy, your address on my email to Barrister Brown. I also was going to explain that I was contacting him as a result of receiving such instructions from you, but then I remembered how you said nobody should know of your involvement in this transaction. I wasn't sure if that included Barrister Peter Brown, so I removed from my message to him my original explanation that explained I was contacting him because of your instructions. I am certain that everything will go hitchlessly and that soon I will be experiencing the joy of welcoming you and your family to the Palmetto Bug State. That's the official nickname for my home state of Florida. Dearest brother and partner in progress, thank you very much for keeping it as discussed as I want us to treat this transaction with utmost confidentiality. However, Keep posted as soon as the attorney respond to your message. Bear in mind, of course, that Lucia and Barrister Brown, no doubt, are the same person, so she doesn't really need me to keep her posted. Thirteen minutes later, I receive a reply from none other than Barrister Pete Brown, a qualified legal practitioner in the United Kingdom, established in 1975. Oddly, however, he isn't listed in the Barrister's Register of all barristers who are authorized to practice in England, must be some sort of database error, I guess. The majority of the partners previously worked in the City of London before coming together at the center of London Docklands. Dear Barrister Pete Brown, thank you for your reply. It is a pleasure to make the acquaintance of you. Almost 50 years of being the boss of your own law firm, that is quite an accomplishment. I am certain you must truly love your work. I don't know when people are required to retire in the United Kingdom, but I will wager you are not looking forward to no longer coming to your own place of business after so many years. I'm looking forward to working in partnership with you as you come most highly recommended to me. As you know, this particular matter involves ExxonMobil. Have you previously worked on legal matters that involve them? By the way, and I realize I am about to depart from the primary goal of this correspondence and beg your indulgence, I have a cousin who also is a rather well-known attorney in the United Kingdom, Mr. Ollie Holmes. I am somewhat embarrassed to say I don't know if he's a barrister or a solicitor, which are things we don't have here. I haven't actually seen Ollie since he and his parents visited my family at our farm when I was but a child, and we have not kept in touch since then, but he and I have maintained a strong familial bond for all of these years. Like you, he used to work in London. Around 15 years ago, however, he relocated his law practice, or law chambers, as you would say, to the resort area of Hull. Since then, he has been semi-retired, spending most of his time ice fishing, but also accepting the occasional legal assignment. 
I expect he also often regales the whole legal community with some of his best-known exploits from his years as a London barrister or solicitor. You mentioned the senior partner in your law practice. Because the practice is named after you, I would have expected the senior partner to be you, but apparently that expectation would be misguided. Should I be writing to the senior partner, or is it you who will be handling this matter? If I should be writing to the senior partner, I will be grateful if you would be kind enough to provide me with his or her name and contact information, and I shall contact him or her directly if that is what you prefer. The registered name with ExxonMobil, which you requested, is McLen Home Values LLC, which is legally registered throughout the state of Florida, USA. Together with the documentation you already have received from ExxonMobil, I believe you now have everything necessary to complete the successful conclusion of this arrangement. As promised, I advise Lucia that I have been in touch with the barrister. Hello, Lucia. I received a reply from Barrister Pete Brown. Most of what he said was sort of a commercial for his law practice, talking about things I didn't really understand. You know, for example, they operate through a series of departments and have closely linked offices, and also something about something called London Ducklands, of which I am completely unfamiliar. He did request for me the registered name with ExxonMobil. I told him it's McLean Home Values LLC, which is what I hope he was asking for. I will keep you posted on any further correspondences with Barrister Brown. Lucia assures me that there is no room to worry about the attorney, as his office is very capable and will definitely handle the process. The registered name is McLean Home Values LLC and is registered with ExxonMobil. I thank Lucia for your assurances, re the attorney we are using. He sounds as though he is quite busy. I will let you know if I receive any further response from him. In his next email, Barrister Brown doesn't say anything about my attorney cousin, Ollie Holmes, but he does advise me to confirm the following so as to enable us proceed with all due documentation. I have no idea what he's talking about, as I explained to Lucia. I have just received a most puzzling email from Barrister Pete Brown, in which he claims that in order to facilitate the payment, he requires the following documentation from me. Clearly, something is dreadfully wrong, for I feel a deep, burning disappointment in Barrister Brown's understanding of the issues at hand. You and I both expected him to take swift action upon receipt of the name of the new LLC, which I gave him in my introductory email to him. Instead, however, he is demanding all sorts of extraneous and unnecessary documentation. I do not wish to fling any aspersions at Barrister Brown's motivations, but in all honest candor, he appears to be engaging in what is known as fee-jacking, in which the client's legal fees are manipulated by all sorts of unexpected last-moment requirements that aren't really required, but which ultimately result in the client being presented with an outrageously high bill for the lawyer barrister's alleged services. I have had a funny feeling about this character from the moment of my first communication with him. As I happened to mention to Barrister Brown, I have a cousin who also is a rather well-known attorney in the United Kingdom, Mr. Ollie Holmes, who has practiced law from his home in Hull, England, for many years. I think we should consider asking Ollie to handle the legal details of this transaction in place of Barrister Brown. In addition to being a trusted relative of mine, as it happens, Ollie has several openings for new clients and I'm sure could dispatch with these technicalities quickly and with all due speed. What are your thoughts on all of this? As it happens, Lucia has all the information the barrister is asking for and does not think we need to change the attorney as I am confident that Pete Brown will handle the situation therefore. Let us not involve Mr. Ollie Holmes. Strangely, nine hours later, she sends me an identical copy of that reply, except it's formatted differently to fit neatly on one page. Clearly, she is eager for me to respond to Barrister Pete Brown, so I reply, I will forward the information you have sent me to Barrister Pete Brown per your request. The thing about some lawyers, barristers, is they are in love with paperwork and what is known for some reason as red tape. Whenever you think they have everything they need to complete the job you are paying them to complete, they come back and tell you, oh yes, there is one more thing that I need from you. I am trustful, however, that Barrister Pete Brown will not reply with yet another demand for more of something or other. If he does, I am afraid that will tell us something about his professional integrity that we shall be sad to learn. Unless I am interrupted by another phone call, which seems happens more and more these days, as soon as I send this email to you, I will send the information you have provided to me to Barrister Pete Brown and I keep my promise, sending him the information he requested and adding, I have been assured that there are no further requirements required to execute this 100% valid claim of my contractual payment from ExxonMobil. Thank you in advance for expediting the remainder of this process and promptly issuing payment. 
One minute later, Barrister Pete Brown acknowledges receipt of the requested information and that now I am required to pay him $18,700 United States dollars. Whoa! I didn't see that coming. I think the best course here is to ignore his demand for money and hope that he'll forget about that part. Thank you for your confirmation of receipt of the requested verification information. Do you know what day the contracted payment should arrive in my bank account, or if not the exact date and approximation of when you think it will arrive? And as promised, I send Lucia a new status report. I sent the information to Barrister Pete Brown, who replied that we are in receipt of your email and the contents noted. I replied to thank him for the confirmation and to ask a question about the transfer of the funds. I have not yet had a response from him. I will try to remember to BCC you on any future emails I sent whoops, to Barrister Pete Brown. Thirteen minutes later, I receive another email from Barrister Pete asking me to confirm my phone number. Oh, and by the way, send me $18,700 United States dollars. Once again, I ignore his reference to the rather large advance fee and repeat my earlier questions. Do you know what date the contracted payment should arrive in my bank account, or if not the exact date and approximation of when you think it will arrive? If I didn't know better, I'd think Lucia Jacobs and Barrister Pete Brown work in the same office because just 54 minutes later I receive a new message from Lucia advising me of a little problem she has. At this moment, all I have is 10,000 pounds, and as such, we are going to be short of the equivalent of U.S. dollars 4,850. I thought the money I had would have taken care of the documentation process. Please, my dearest brother, your financial support will be highly appreciated, knowing fully well that whatever expenses incurred in this transaction will be deducted upon receipt before the sharing, as agreed. I am counting on you as a brother and partner in progress to enable us to finalize this arrangement. I hope to hear from you soon and do request for payment instruction from the attorney to enable me affect the part payment. Note that once the attorney is done with the documentation process, as soon as the fee is paid, the funds release will be done within one week. She seems quite upset, so I reply reassuringly. Yes, Barrister Pete Brown did say something about the authentication and handling charges that you will be taken care of. If you don't want me to mention you to him, by what method will you be able to get the payment to him? Next, I hear from Barrister Pete Brown, who declares the telephone number recorded in your file with ExxonMobil is not working, as all attempt to reach you on phone proves abortive. Therefore, I want you to confirm the correct telephone numbers. I promptly tell Pete Brown, the telephone number you are asking about is a working number. I have received calls on that number, which long has been my number, multiple times today. When you attempted to telephone me, did you include the country code for the USA, one to call me from the United Kingdom, you would need to dial 1 and then the rest of the number. If you have been dialing my number without including the country code, that probably is the reason I have not yet received the payment that I had expected to be delivered to me by now. If you have any more difficulty telephoning me, please let me know. By sheer coincidence, a mere 13 minutes later, Lucia is back in my inbox. Dearest Rob, how are you once again? I presume you are doing great. I told you in my email of yesterday that all I can afford is 10,000 pounds, about US dollars 13,850, and as such, we are going to be short of the equivalent to US dollars 4,850. I need you to help assist with the balance of US dollars 4,850 while I come up with US dollars 13,850. Note that whatever expenses incurred in this transaction will definitely be deducted before the sharing, as agreed upon, therefore, I plead that you help with the balance. Hope to hear from you soon so the attorney can proceed with the arrangement. Hello, Lucia. I do not have U.S. dollars 4,850. Otherwise, I would be happy to assist you. I certainly understand what it is like to have little money, even if for you it is only a temporary situation. If my arithmetic is correct, you have the ability to pay the barrister 65% of the documentation process right now, that would leave a balance of only 35%. I'm certain that Barrister Pete Brown's legal firm will have no problem with your paying the remaining 35%. The way it usually works is the legal firm sends you an invoice for however much money you owe them, and then you have at least 30 days before you have to pay it. Because Pete Brown Chambers is such a large, established firm, they easily should be able to extend the payment period for the remaining 35% to 90 days or three months, giving you plenty of breathing room in which to breathe. Although, and I depend upon you to keep this confidential and not tell him I said this, I have found Barrister Pete Brown to be kind of stuffy and curt in his manner, 
to have become as successful as he is, he must have a respect and caring for his clients. Probably he's just not what is known as a people person. But inside, of course, he's as human as you or I. Until now, we have kept you invisible to Barrister Pete Brown. I think now, however, we have to bring you into this transaction visibly so that he can see you are part of it. I know you are concerned about protecting your privacy, probably to shield your children and your wife from undue prying. But anything you say or email to Barrister Pete Brown will be 100% confidential by law. In the USA, the legal term for that is attorney-client privilege, and all attorneys are bound 100% by that rule. It might be called something different in the United Kingdom, but I know from one of my cousins who is a lawyer barrister working in the resort town of Hull that the same law exists in your country, perhaps under a different name. So even if he wanted to, Barrister Pete Brown could not divulge any communications between you and him. And, of course, I am sure he would not want to divulge anything due to his high position and reputation, which in some ways is the most important thing a lawyer, attorney, barrister can have, other than a law school degree, of course. I am sure if you contact him directly, you will find Barrister Pete Brown to be a warm and understanding person. And because you are a woman and not a man, like me, probably he will be much nicer and more friendly to you than he has been to me. After all, what you are asking for, to be extended the typical 90 days before your remaining 35% is due, is not at all unreasonable or improper. If, however, you would be uncomfortable talking to Barrister Pete Brown about it, I will be happy to talk to him about it myself. I will explain the situation, stressing your desire for privacy and confidentiality. I am very, very confident that when I explain it to him, he will prove to be most accommodating. May I have your permission to speak directly to Barrister Pete Brown about this? Probably it also would be a good idea for me to provide him with your direct email address to facilitate further direct communication between you and him. Please let me know so that we can take our next steps toward a successful conclusion of this transaction. At this point, I am reminded once again by Barrister Pete Brown that I have to do the needful by making arrangement for the payment release. I reply, thank you for sending me the email to which I am responding. An unexpected speed bump has appeared on what until now has been the smooth roadway to my receipt of the payment, which I am very much looking forward to. Due to a certain confidentiality which I am obliged to maintain, I am unable to advise you of the details of what I'm sure will be a very temporary, easy-to-fix interruption of our progress. I wish I could say more about this now, but before I can share the details with you, I need to obtain a confidentiality waiver from someone. As a barrister, undoubtedly you have experienced confidentiality-related incidents many times over the years. Please do not be concerned. I expect this to be a very temporary situation, which will be resolved today, or at the latest, tomorrow. Pete Brown replies that he is pleased to inform you that without the full payment for the handling charges and the authentication regularization of your contract documents, we cannot proceed with the arrangement. Therefore, we encourage you to do the needful. Something about that wording bothers me. We'll return to that later, but for now, I reply, as I explained in my previous email, I am awaiting receipt of a confidentiality waiver from a third party before I can respond more fully to your request. Thank you for your patience. Next, Lucia emails me in an attempt to nudge me into action. Dearest Rob, how are you today? I presume you are doing great. I write to confirm the receipt of your email and the contents noted. I am worried because I was hoping and believing that you will support me financially but I am disturbed as you are not willing to support me in this transaction, knowing fully well that whatever expenses incurred in this transaction will definitely be deducted before the sharing as agreed upon. I need you to help with the balance so we can get this concluded as quickly as possible. Hope to hear from you soon. I helpfully reply with both an explanation and a solution. Hello, Lucia. I am not really doing so great as I would like due to the heat-related death of a beloved pet earlier this week. I feel so sad about it, although I know with time I will forget about him. On a happier note, I think you have misunderstood. I am very willing to support you financially in this transaction, if I had the money to do so. Because of the COVID virus, I am in the same position as many other people in this country. I was laid off from my job more than a year ago, as all bowling alleys were shut down to help limit the spread of this deadly virus that has been responsible for so many deaths. Except for approximately $50 in my Christmas savings account, I didn't have any savings to fall back on, except for my credit cards, which I have used for everything I needed to buy until very recently when the credit card company sent me a letter saying they wouldn't let me buy any more things until I paid back some of the money they loaned me during the past year. And I even had to take all the money out of my Christmas savings account, too. But as I explained in a previous email, if you just ask Barrister Pete Brown to invoice you for the outstanding balance, I am certain he will be happy to extend you 90 days in which to pay that amount. 
But in fact, and I apologize for not having thought of this sooner, you won't have to wait 90 days before you can pay the outstanding 35%. I promise that as soon as the funds are transferred to me, I will immediately send you the 70% that is rightfully yours. That would mean Barrister Pete Brown would have to wait only a few days, maybe a week to 10 days, for you to send him the remainder of his fee. Here's how it would work. One, you send him the 10,000 pounds you do have and instruct Barrister Pete Brown to invoice you for the remaining 3,500 pounds to be paid within 90 days. Two, the fund totaling US dollars 11.9 million would be sent to me. Three, I immediately would transfer to you your entire 70% US dollars 8,330,000. Four, you would then easily take just U.S. dollars 4,850 of the U.S. dollars 8,330,000 and send it to Barrister Pete Brown's legal firm, surprising them by sending that money long before the 90 days they expected it to take. I have not brought up the subject with him because you have asked me not to mention you to him. Because of this unexpected shortness of funds, however, I think the best idea is for me to explain to him who you are and give him your email address so the two of you can communicate directly. Although I find him to be kind of stuffy and a bit stiff, undoubtedly he will be much more courteous and friendly to you as a woman with a family and also with a tragic history regarding the sad death of your husband. Please believe me, attorneys, barristers deal with this sort of thing all the time, and agreeing to wait 30 or 90 days for the rest of the payment will not be a problem. His legal firm is very successful and long established. I think he said something like for 40 years. And although to regular people like you and me, U.S. dollars 4850 is a large sum of money to him and his legal company. That is nothing more than chicken food. May I have your permission to explain to Barrister Pete Brown who you are and also your email address? No, I may not have her permission. Please do not give out my information to the attorney. I will suggest you tell him that a friend of yours will be assisting with a part payment of £10,000 while you source for the balance because I did ask one of his colleagues if they can accept a part payment and she told me in confidence that the payment must be paid in full. Therefore, your suggestion will not be granted. I still not believe you can't assist or support me with a balance. I really need your help at this point in time so we can get this concluded. Because I, Rob, Rob, McClen, am a person of his word, I assure her, okay, I won't give your information to the attorney. Why is it so important to keep your participation a secret? Are we breaking any sorts of rules? Everything seems above board to me, hence my puzzlement at the secrecy. If I may speak from my many years of long experience, it is a mistake to accept no from anyone who is not at the top of the organization. If you're not the boss, it's always safer for an employee to say, no, we can't do that. But the boss has the power to say, I know the rules say we can't do that, but I am giving it my okay, so it's okay to do that upon my authority. There is a city in Florida that you've probably heard of called Ocala. Many years ago, long before it became a big tourist destination, I happened to be passing through Ocala and stopped at a little hamburger restaurant that I had heard about from a neighbor who used to live around there because he said they served great hamburgers. I ordered a large burger and a Coke. This was before I switched to Diet Coke after my doctor elucided me to reduce the amount of sugar intake I took in each day. Because I ordered the luncheon special, my meal also was supposed to come with french fries, which I since have learned are not good for you, and we shouldn't eat them if we can avoid it. Anyway, I asked the girl at the cash register if I could have steak fries instead of french fries. In case you're not familiar, steak fries have no steak in them. They're pretty much the same as french fries, except they're straightened out instead of being all wrinkled. She said no, and I asked why not, and she said the rule is that you get french fries with a luncheon special, but you can't have steak fries instead. I asked to speak to the manager, who came out from somewhere in the back. He didn't look any older than the girl, but he was the manager. He asked if he could help me, and I said I'd like to have steak fries instead of french fries with my luncheon special. You know what he said? Remember, this is the exact same restaurant where the girl, who was not a manager, said no, I couldn't. But he said, sure, okay. I know that's kind of a long story, but it's an excellent example of why you should never accept a no from someone who isn't the boss or manager. I told that kind of long story from many years ago to illustrate why I think it is a mistake for us to accept no from one of the colleagues who only work there but aren't the actual boss. The boss is Barrister Pete Brown, and I am confident that if I explain the situation to him and ask if it's okay to invoice you for the remaining amount of money for 30 days, he'll almost certainly say, certainly, that will not be a problem. So what I propose is that I continue not to mention you at all, but simply ask Barrister Pete Brown if he would be gentlemanly enough to invoice me or my representative per the details above. He is almost certain to say yes, and you still will be confidential from him. So everybody would be happy that way. Sound good to you? 
If so, I will email Barrister Pete Brown at my earliest convenience and ask him to approve my request as boss of his firm. To resort to that old cliche, if you don't ask, they won't know you want something. But with your agreement, I will be able to go ahead and ask, and I'm sure once he knows, he will courteously say yes. Please let me know your thoughts about my plan, which I assure you will succeed. Uncharacteristically, I don't hear from Lucia for a few days, so I let her know. I have been waiting to hear back from you regarding my idea of speaking directly to Barrister Pete Brown rather than not pursuing my 90 days idea simply because one of his employees told you they wouldn't do such a thing. But of course, I have been honoring your request that you not be mentioned in relation to this endeavor. Is it okay with you if I do mention you while explaining the situation directly to Barrister Pete Brown? Oh, also, I had meant to ask you, won't you need to reveal yourself anyway when you pay the fee? This time she does reply, letting me know, I want you to understand that what member of the chambers told me is exactly what Pete Brown will eventually tell you. Therefore, I need you to help me with the balance as a partner in this transaction. I will suggest you get the balance available before communicating with Pete Brown else. It will not be helpful as informed by the member of the chamber. That, as the kids say, is quite a bummer. But a promise is a promise, which is why I reply, although we see the question of whether or not I should speak with Barrister Pete Brown about this differently, of course I will honor your wish that I not do so. I still am confused about how you have been planning to keep your participation secret when you pay the payment. I mean, even before you discovered the discrepancy between how much you'd have to pay and how much money you have available. Is there some method that allows you to make the payment anonymously? Or, and now that I think of it, I think this might be more correct, is the payment simply going to be made by ExxonMobil in London as a company and not as any particular individual? If I had to guess, that would be my guess. But as the old saying, I don't know if you use the saying in the United Kingdom, but as the old saying goes, the smart pilot flies by knowledge and not by guessing. It seems we have only two obstacles remaining. One, making the payment without your identity being revealed. But I'm certain you have a logical method for that, and I'm keenly interested to learn what that method is. Two, figuring out where to get the sum of money we need to get to make up the difference. Please say hello to Rita for me, and I'll look forward to the additional information. Uh, P.S. I noticed that all three names of your children come from the Bible. Was that a conscious choice to reflect your religion, or just a coincidence? I dutifully update Barrister Pete Brown. I apologize for the unexpected delay in completing the final steps for completing the transfer we have been discussing. A recent corporate restructuring of McLean Home Values LLC has resulted in a slight delay in the completion of some paperwork that needs to be completed before we can finish concluding our transaction. We should be fully up to speed with the paperwork within just a day or two. 62 minutes later, I hear from Lucia again. As per my payment, it will either be paid in person by a friend on your behalf or have it sent through wire transfer by a friend. However, the major issue at the moment is for you to put yours together, which is very important, else we are going round the circle. I want to plead with you to assist with the balance so we can proceed. I hope to hear from you soon on the balance payment, which is the born of contention. Hello, Lucia. When you referred to a born of contention, I am puzzled what to say because from the very beginning, you explained that all the outstanding payment would be made by you as the company's recognized representative in London. Do you know what happened to the missing $4,800? You explained that in addition to you, there are various heads of department and officials involved in this transaction. Do you suspect one of them to have scooped into the funds total in an unauthorized manner? For the sake of being clear, I want to declare I would not think that is the case. But sometimes things that we think could not happen, happen. Or maybe one of them made a simple accounting error that can be reversed by correcting the error. It makes me feel bad when you say I am not willing to support you in this transaction. If I had $4,850, I would be happy to lend that amount to the transaction because I understand I would get it back in the end. Just like you, I believe in keeping to my words and not letting you down, but I don't have $4,850. I know that small amount probably seems like chicken food to a company as large as yours, but for me, it is a high sum that I do not have. I don't even know exactly how I will be paying my lawyer for making the LLC we needed. Probably I will receive his invoice at the end of this month, which is when I'll know the amount. I'm confident that if I ask, he will allow me at least 30 days to pay him. So I haven't been worrying about it because I knew our transaction would be concluded before then. And however much his invoice is, I could pay it out of my 30%. On top of that, I have not yet received the numerous bills I will be receiving in relation to my hospital stay last month, which I may or may not have mentioned to you because there was no point in worrying you. But unlike the United Kingdom, 
The only people who get comprehensive health care that doesn't even cost them anything are the political representatives, senators, etc., who make the laws that allow them to get free health care that the rest of us have to pay for with our taxes. Otherwise, if you're not a politician or rich, usually you can't afford to get sick or to need a hospital procedure. I shatter to think how much all of those bills will total, but again, I have taken comfort in the fact that I will be able to pay them out of my 30%. What about asking the various heads of department and officials who are involved to contribute smaller amounts that would total the amount you need? With all of these bills coming due that I will have to pay, it is alarming to suddenly learn that a roadblock has jumped up to block the completion of this transaction. But I tell myself not to worry, because you and your other involved colleagues are very experienced and are certain to come up with a solution that works and makes everyone happy. Don't you think so? P.S. Did you see my earlier question about whether the names of your children come from the Bible? A couple of hours later, I hear from Pete Brown, who once again strongly advises that you do the needful. This time, I bring up something that's been bothering me for a while. I am concerned by your puzzling statement that you are pleased by this delay. I have been puzzling over it since you said that to me in your July 15 email. Surely, with the transactional operations such as this of such importance and the potential to do so much good for so many people, both known and unknown, Telling me you are pleased that we cannot proceed with the arrangement, therefore, is incomprehensible to me. If for some reason you are opposed to the transaction we have been working so hard to transact, I believe legal ethics obligate you either to withdraw your services or relinquish them to a colleague who would want us to move forward as quickly and as smoothly as possible. Just as delay defeats equity and paper covers rock, we all, each of us, are supposed to be working as a team. I hope upon reflection you will agree and will take appropriate action. Barely an hour later, Again, I hear from Lucia. I write to inform you that it is obvious you cannot assist in this transaction, and as such, we shall be looking for another partner since you cannot afford to assist or support in this regard. The two hardest tests on the spiritual road are the patience to wait for the right moment and the courage not to be disappointed with what we encounter. Behind every exquisite thing that existed, there was something tragic. I sincerely appreciate your time, and I promise to reward you for your time. I will advise that you send me a power of attorney authorizing me to source for another partner. Hope to hear from you soon. And she does. Hello, Lucia. I am quite surprised to be told that because $4,850 of the monies you voluntarily promised for the necessary fees mysteriously has gone missing, you wish to dissolve the partnership into which I have devoted so much time and effort. You state, I promise to reward you for your time. How do you propose to keep that promise? Suddenly and unexpectedly, it appears your promises cannot be relied upon, at least sometimes. I cannot consider sending you a power of attorney before, at the very least, you have compensated me for the 1547 U.S. dollars I am obligated to pay my attorney for having created and filed the documents necessary for the LLC that you said we needed. As you know, I am the sole officer of the LLC. As such, I am the only person authorized to speak act, assign, or negotiate on behalf of McLean Home Values, LLC. It also is perplexing to have no explanation provided to explain how, after all this work, you suddenly discovered that you do not have a large portion of the money you had committed to providing. One of the first things you told me was that you are a religious Christian woman. For the sake of your own eternal spirit, I hope you will consider and recognize the risk you bring unto your immortal soul by not keeping your promises. Certainly, you do not need me to remind you of the Bible's admonition that whatever you say you shall do, you shall do, else you will not be admitted to God's kingdom after your brief mortal time has passed. I cannot believe that Rita approves of your surprising, unchristian-like declaration. Have you discussed this with her? Once the $1,547 U.S. dollars legal fees to my attorney have been reimbursed to me by you, I will consider your request that I relinquish my rightful role in this transaction. Also, to avoid any possible future misunderstanding, I feel obliged to point out that until and unless you have fully honored your commitments to me in this venture, my generous invitation to host you and your family here in Florida will remain suspended indefinitely or possibly withdrawn. Regretfully, I also should make clear to you that under these new disappointing circumstances, I must withdraw any and all previous offers to enlist the assistance of one or more of my cousins should the need arise. I am hopeful that after you have had a good night's sleep and a long, serious prayer session with a Christian God, you will change the course you suddenly have strayed onto and comprehend the wisdom of returning to the righteousness that brought us together in the first place. Lucia, as it turns out, is not totally to be trusted as she tells me. It will interest you to know that I eventually opened up to Pete Brown. As I introduced myself as your partner, however, I told him that you have given me the power to stand in hence. 
I am looking out for someone to partner with me since you do not have the financial backings or liquidity to pay any upfront fees or due diligent fees for this transaction. I'm not sure what dander is, but that really got mine up. As I told Lucia, you are not my partner. I have not given you the power to stand in hence. You are someone who came to me for help with a venture for which you guaranteed on your sacred oath that no money would be required of me in advance. Then, after much time and effort on my part, you claimed that $4,850 of the monies you promised to provide mysteriously had gone missing. When I asked you what happened to that missing money, you did not even reply. Obviously, one of your co-workers must have stolen it, but you don't care even enough to find out who did it and to get that money back so you can keep your promise to me. I have prayed for you, explaining in my prayers that you are a religious Christian woman and honest. But my prayers have been for naught. Clearly, the Lord knows you only pretend to be a Christian. Do Rita and Joshua and John know that you break one of God's ten best commandments by not telling the truth about things? At least your late husband, Andrew, is spared from having to witness the degradation into which you have fallen. To be clear, you do not have my power of attorney. You do not have the power to stand in hence. I am formally revoking my invitation to you and your family to visit me and play tennis. I am very, very, very disappointed in you. That prompts what turns out to be the final communication from Lucia, and I am struck by something genuinely surprising. Her declaration that I never promised to raise the balance of 3,500 pounds. She sounds genuinely offended by that accusation, and I realize she's correct. Sure, she's a scammer, but she never has made such a promise, and it appears that unwarranted accusation has offended her. There's an important lesson we all can learn from this encounter. If you know what that lesson is, please say so in the comments field below, because I can't figure out what that important lesson is. And if you enjoyed this video, please like it and subscribe to my channel. We still have room for a few more subscribers. Don't worry, I'll squeeze you in. Our next big scam baiting video probably will feature a military hero with a tragic past, the mysterious death of a beloved pet, and most unexpectedly of all, the nicest of all possible scammers, at least until we reach the end of our correspondence. Before that one, however, I'm debating whether to share with you a quite brief correspondence with a scammer who also happens to be Postmaster General of the United States. My legal advisor thinks that's a bad idea. If you want to see the entire brief correspondence, just leave a quick comment to let me know. It's been an honor to share this scam baiting adventure with you. In sincerity and on behalf of Rob Rob McClen.